Open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Continue our study on Christ's humiliation. We'll find that there is much to say about Christ's death. We've looked at our Lord's humbling incarnation, his humbling life, and now we come to the deepest moments in all of our Savior's humiliation as we look at his death. We want to consider by looking at what John Flavel directs us in his book that we're studying together, The Nature of Christ's Death. Much can be said about it, and as we look at the various particulars and and aspects of what Christ suffered for us, there will be a lot to consider. Tonight we just look at the nature of it. What, What can we say from the scripture? What can we say about the nature of our Savior's death? It's obvious from what we've learned in the gospel, what we've studied together, that Christ's death was the principal part of his humiliation. It culminated, as Philippians 2 makes clear, it culminated here. As he comes down, as he condescends, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, took on the form of a servant, coming and condescending even to the point of death, and then Paul says, even to death on a cross. Christ takes this amazing descent. This is where his obedience and humiliation culminated. This was the crowning act of his obedience, which began in his coming into the womb of the virgin. Behold, I come to do your will, O God. In fact, from the moment that Christ took a body to himself in the womb of the virgin, he started on a trajectory of humiliation, of suffering, and of obedience that would irrevocably lead him to the cross. To take that first step in the incarnation led to this very place. Because this, of course, is the covenant of redemption, designates this is the reason he has come. He came to die. Remember his famous words in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what he has been eyeing in his life, what he has been aiming at, this principal part of his humiliation, the cursed cross on Calvary. But this is also the chief pillar of our consolation. This is where Christ dealt with sin, death, hell. This is where Christ dealt with the curse and the wrath of God. This is where Christ bore it all. Again, the culminating place of humiliation. This is where so much was accomplished on our behalf that we might find comfort and encouragement. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that if Christ is not raised... Our faith is in vain, we're still in our sins, we are the most to be pitied. We might also the say, say the same here. If Christ had not died in the manner of his atoning death, if he had not died in this fashion as our atoning sacrifice, we're still dead in our sins, our faith is in vain, and we are of most of all people most to be pitied. The doctrine that Flavel sets forth in this section is this. Christ was not only put to death, but to the worst kind of death, even death on a cross, taking that language from Philippians chapter 2. So let's consider a few of these factors and see how he became a curse for us and what he suffered in his body and soul, all the curses of the moral law of God in his death. Let's begin then with Acts 2, begin verse 22, and we'll turn over to Acts 4. Acts 2, 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Peter, of course, proclaiming, to all who gathered around to hear. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Turn over to chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. middle of this prayer, the disciples are praying to the Lord for boldness that they might continue to minister the gospel after they had been charged not to speak in this name anymore. Come to the Lord in prayer. In verse 27, for truly in this city 
that were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. The comfort in these verses is, although Christ's life, if you will, was taken by men and he was crucified and put up on the tree to die, yet the reality is that behind whatever men did unto our Savior was the, the appointed plan of God, the definite plan, the foreknowledge, the predetermined plan and purpose of our Lord to send Christ. And we know this. We've studied this in our catechism in Sunday school, that Christ was sent by the Father on this mission to rescue, to save his elect. Christ came for this very purpose. So as much as we look at all of this and the, the sufferings of Christ and the culmination of his suffering and humiliation in the cross, let us remember to our comfort and encouragement that the Father ordained that it should be so because this is not only how it was to be, but this is necessary in order to deal with our sin. This had to be done this way. We could not be saved in any other way. First thing we think about Christ's death is the nature of it, and that is that it was a violent death. Turn to Isaiah 53. This Old Testament gospel of Isaiah. Christ's sufferings are brought to the fore in this chapter, Isaiah 53, more than in any other, I believe, in the Old Testament. Types and foreshadows all over the place, but here, what a clear declaration of his sufferings. Christ's death was a violent death. Look at verse 8. Isaiah 53, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And of course, we could go back up and take up even more of the description. Pierced, crushed, chastised, wounded, oppressed, afflicted, slaughtered, silent. Christ giving himself to all this. So Christ was cut off, it says, from the land of the living. It was unnatural. Christ wasn't aged. He wasn't on his way out anyway. He was in the prime of his life. And furthermore, there was no sin in him to justify him suffering the wages. Ezekiel 18.4 says, The soul that sins shall die. Death comes upon the sinner. It was unnatural for death to seize Christ. Remember what Christ said to the disciples just leading into the garden. Right? The prince of darkness comes. His hour is coming, but he has nothing in me. Right? Christ has no sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. There's no reason for Christ to suffer death. Unless, of course, there is a reason. If he comes, as we learned this morning, as a surety for others. So he's cut off. It's unnatural. <coughs> he's in the prime of his life. And, of course, his death was sacrificial. He was slaughtered as a lamb led to the slaughter. Think of how the animals were treated. Go back to Leviticus and look at the description of how the animals were to be sacrificed, the manner by which their life was taken from them. Christ, of course, not undergoing all of that, but that's the foreshadow of what, how he was treated. And we know how he was treated, nailed to the cross. And, of course, even before that, crowned with thorns, beaten, struck, his beard plucked from his mouth, from his cheeks. He was offered up as a sacrifice. Deuteronomy 17, we're told that that which is lame, that which is sick, that which is maimed in any way could not be offered to God. Only an animal, a lamb in particular, without blemish, spotless, in good health. That was the sacrifice that God would accept. Remember Malachi chapter 1 where God rebukes his people? Offer that to your governor and see if he's pleased. How dare you offer such lame, maimed, sick animals to me? It was in complete violation of what God had said in the rules for sacrifices. And all that pointed to Christ. Christ is taken, not as one maimed, as one defiled or spotted, one useless and worthless in and of himself, but he was taken as one who was spotless, pure, innocent, undefiled, healthy, strong. He was, of course, the firstborn of the flock, wasn't he? The lamb, the only lamb of God. 
It was a violent death as he is cut off. Secondly, it was a painful death. We saw this in Acts 2.24. What we see particularly is that Christ's senses were more acute than ordinary. And they continued to be so throughout all of his sufferings. You remember Matthew 27, they offered him, right? Wine to drink, right? Offered him something to alleviate, something to numb him. What did he do? Once he tasted it and knew what it was, he didn't drink it. He wanted it to be in full senses. Why? This isn't something a man can do in a drunken stupor. That's not an acceptable sacrifice. Christ has to voluntarily submit to this suffering. He has to knowingly, conscientiously, intentionally, voluntarily submit and yield to the wrath of God taking on the sins and the curse of his people. His senses were never dulled or blunted. (coughs) His death contained the greatest pains imaginable because they were intended to equal all the misery that our sin deserved. He was literally being judged for the elect. Remember, Paul says one might die for a good man. If that were the case, one might suffer what one man deserved, but imagine suffering what all men deserve, that is, all the church. Christ has taken on what all his church deserves. We can't even, as we said this morning, number all our sins. Christ knew our sins. They were numbered by God. All of the sins, all of the misery, all of the curse due to the elect were placed on Christ. And from his flesh, if you will, was exacted the payment and the price for the very list of transgressions. It wasn't this blanket suffering. I think that'll cover it. It was particular payment in light of particular sins. We can't even understand this. Imagine suffering all the pains of the damned elect at once. Imagine the sorrows in his soul. We've looked at that. His soul sufferings. The torturing Pains in his body, the beatings, the blows, the piercing of the thorns, the, again, the plucking of the, the beard, the striking after they had blindfolded him, scourging that tore his flesh. Isaiah says he did not even appear to be a man. What is this mass of flesh? The boring, of course, through his hands and his feet with nails. And what we cannot see, but what we know is the case, all of the evil and all of the malice of all of the devils and all that men could pour out on him as much as God would allow. All of the rage of hell. And yet Hebrews 12 says, he endured the cross. Or take the words of Paul so often. He laid himself down. He offered himself up. He gave himself for us. Christ volunteered for this. Christ's sacrifice would not have been acceptable unless it was voluntary. Hebrews 10, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. He volunteered for this, for you. Out of love, for you. He makes this very clear in John 10, 18. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself, this charge I have received from the Father. It was a violent death. It was a painful death. It was a shameful death. Turn to Mark 15. It is difficult to read through this section of Mark, Mark 15, beginning in verse 16 through verse 32. I encourage you to read that again. And mark all of the shame and the mockery that fills these verses. Christ is shamefully mocked and treated by men. It's gut-wrenching to read. It's hard to see what our Savior went through. Jesus is mocked, heads the section. And that's exactly the case. He was stripped. 
naked and exposed as a spectacle of shame. He was condemned to death as a criminal. He was killed in the most torturous manner conceived by the bloody Romans, crucified, and that between two thieves. And yet, Hebrews 12 says he endured it. But Hebrews 12 says he not only endured it, but for the joy set before him, he despised the shame. Christ's death and all the preparatives leading up to it in this chapter in particular, in Mark 15, Christ's death is filled with shame. He was ignominious. And he despised that shame, says the writer. He slighted and cast out of his mind all the disgrace that was poured out on him by his enemies. He contemned all their blasphemies, all the taunts, all the reproaches, all the shameful treatment he received from sinners, and even the most shameful death of the cross itself between two wretched and despicable thieves. And here's what Hebrews 12 was pointing out, and Peter also picks this up in 1 Peter chapter 2. He suffered it all without any emotion of vengeance or anger or hatred or malice or murmuring. Instead, praying, Father, forgive them. And instead, living out the resolution that we hear in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. If any, any ill emotion would have arisen in our Lord's heart, it would have been sin. Christ endured the cross, endured the shame, despising it, and yet unable to escape from it. It was part, part of his suffering. He came to be made ashamed of, to be contemned to be held up as a spectacle of shame. And then it was cursed. Galatians 3.13 says he became a curse for us. We know from Deuteronomy 21, to be hung shamefully on a tree, to die helpless and despised in the sight of men. Moses says that was evidence that a man was cursed by God. This was, if you will, in the statute book of Israel governing rules. But that capital punishment in Israel, which foreshadowed Christ's suffering, was fulfilled in his death. As he died not only in a cursed manner before men, but under the curse, under the curse of the law on our behalf. Cursed, says Deuteronomy, was the man who hung there. But Christ was doubly cursed because he bore in his body and in his soul the wrath of God for our covenant breaking. It was a lingering death, says Flavel. It's not the proper term, really. The idea here is that it was a sudden death, actually. Flavel is trying to get at the fact that his life lingered in him. It's more properly... We should see it as a sudden death because the reality is that most men died on the cross gradually. It was a very long death. They died by degrees. Their sense of pain would be blunted toward the end until they finally just gave up the ghost. But Christ stood, stood under the pains, <clears throat> the full pains of death in his full strength until the very end. Turn over to Mark 15, 39. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. It's a remarkable response to what? Verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Turn to Matthew 27. See the parallel passage. Matthew 27, verse 50. 
And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. The response of the centurion isn't given by Matthew, it's given by Mark. And the centurion stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last. He didn't expire as other men expire in a crucifixion. He didn't go by degrees, slowly, gasping, until finally he dies. No, Christ went out, if you will, with a shout. He went out with this loud cry. And what's so remarkable that the centurion had this kind of remark, that truly this man was a son of God because there is no such strength in a man at this point in his life and in this point in his dying to be able to give this loud cry. And yet Christ. And so what we see is that at the point of death, because it's at that point that he gave up the ghost, at the point of death, Christ is in his fullest strength. There was no dying by degrees. It was a sudden giving up of the ghost. And he was in his full senses and in his full strength, suffering with every nerve in his body and every ounce of his soul, suffering the fullness of the wrath of God, the full weight of the curse. None of his senses is blunted. None of his nerves, if you will, is blunted. He has all his wits about him and all of his strength about him. And in that endurance, he suffers the full wrath with his full strength up until he can say it is finished and then with a shout he gives up the ghost shout of completion a shout of accomplishment a shout of victory it's hard to say but so that such that rather this centurion knew that no man ever died on the cross like this man. And of course, he knew the claims. He knew what was said about this man. And here is his response. Truly, he was the Son of God. Finally, it was a helpless death. Sometimes the dying, as you know, were given remedies and reliefs in the midst of their pains to numb their senses, dull their awareness. Mercy. And if they hung there for an extended time, as you know, as the gospel testifies, the soldiers would break their legs to hasten the end. Because in order to breathe, they had to lift themselves up to take a breath. If the legs are broken, there's no breathing. To break the legs was to bring the person to its, his sudden end. Christ, of course, as they went to break his legs, had already died. And they pierced his side. But Christ had none of these remedies. He turned away from the one that they offered. It was a helpless death. No help from men to die. But also no help from God. He was forsaken. Matthew 27, 46, of course. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All help of consolation and comfort and countenance and love and joy, all that Christ eternally enjoyed from the Father in their triune love, that unity of the Godhead, all of that is taken away. The Godhead and its unity is sustained. The Trinity is not ripped apart. Christ is not forsaken, as it were, cut off from the Godhead. That's impossible. Trinity is still fully united in Christ's sufferings. But Christ bears this in his own soul and body. And what is cut off and the manner by which he is forsaken is on this account. Consolation, comfort, joy, peace. All of that is withheld from him in his humanity. He has none of that. And nothing is left in its stead but darkness, loneliness, emptiness, Hopelessness, helplessness, everything meant by hell. He was cast into outer darkness. Everything meant by hell and everything brought on by the sins for which he died. No mercy, no alleviation, no relief. It had to be this way because he had to drink the cup to the dregs. He had to finish the work. He had to die the death in order that we might not. 
In all these ways, we see several factors relative to the nature of his death. What do we take from this? Fayetteville gives us five applications tonight. All drawn from what we see at the cross. First of all, how obvious it is to see the Savior suffer for our sins. No wonder there is forgiveness for sinners. Turn to Colossians 1.14. What an encouragement. There is forgiveness for sinners. Where as we saw in Sunday school this morning, how can God forgive sinners? How can God justify the ungodly? You can see how these two lessons come right together. There's forgiveness because Christ paid. As we said this morning, nobody gets off scot-free. God doesn't sweep our sins under the carpet. God doesn't let bygones be bygones. God doesn't turn a blind eye. God deals with sin in order that he might justly forgive. So Colossians 1.14, beginning in verse 13, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of of sins. The price has been paid for all that we owe. First John 1 John 1.9, as we said this morning, it is now just for God to forgive. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Turn to Romans 3. I mentioned this this morning, but we didn't turn there. Romans 3. Look at verses 23 to 25. And notice that it is God the Father who sets His Son forth in this manner to deal with sin. There is forgiveness. And the proof is that God holds His Son forth to be received by faith in the gospel. 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom... Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. A propitiation. That means the wrath of God has been satisfied. In the gospel, the father holds forth his son to be received by faith. And he does so as a testimony to the fact that his wrath has been propitiated. The wrath due to us for our sins, it has been propitiated. It has been satisfied. He has been appeased. I have no wrath, says God to his church. I have no wrath. And the proof is, here is the sacrifice. Here is Christ held forth. There is forgiveness for sinners. The second comfort to take from this tonight is that there is no condemnation for those who believe. Turn to Romans 8. We were here this morning. Turn back to Romans 8. Look at 33 to 35. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? There is no no one else. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? There is no condemnation for those who believe. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. If we have been justified, we have not been condemned. And having been justified, we can't be condemned, as we saw this morning. So there's no condemnation for those who believe, because by faith they have been justified. Christ was condemned in our place. He was cut off for us. He was forsaken on our behalf. The point to realize here is that Christ didn't just die. Christ wasn't just forsaken. Christ wasn't simply cursed. It's the for us that's the key. Cut off for us. Forsaken for us. Cursed for us. That's where the gospel is. He did it for you. Turn over to Romans 8 again. Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. It's been condemned. It's been dealt with. That is your sin. So that you might not be condemned for it. 
verses 38 to 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Turn over to Hosea chapter 2. God says to his people, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. Do you hear the cross? Righteousness and justice, steadfast love and mercy. In the cross, the justice and the mercy of God meet and kiss each other. God betroths us to himself in righteousness. How can he do that? We are sinners because he deals with our sin and justifies us by Christ's righteousness. And therefore, it is just to welcome us, as we'll see next Lord's Day, to welcome us into his family by adoption. We become his. He will never cease doing us good, Jeremiah 32, 40. There is no condemnation for those who believe. The third comfort tonight, there's no curse in our death. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. There is no curse in our death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The two things Christ dealt with, right? Dealt with our sin, passively subjecting himself to the penalty, dealt with the law that stood against us by actively providing the obedience it needed to be silenced with regard to us. The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God through his active and passive obedience who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no curse in our death. There may be much pain when we die, There may be much suffering. There may be much loss, many tears, maybe even fear. We've all seen loved ones pass away, some quietly and joyfully, others not so much. Some in tremendous pain, some with fear and trepidation, with doubts, unsettled minds, disturbance. Whatever we may meet with in death, the point of the gospel, the point the gospel makes is this. There is no curse there for us. And where there's no curse, then by necessity there's the opposite. Blessing. Cursing and blessing. It's not one, it's the other. And what that means is, Regardless how we may meet it, regardless how we may see others meet it, death is our friend. Death takes us away from all the misery we will ever know. Death will take you away from all the hell you will ever experience. Death will be your chauffeur to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Death will be your threshold to eternal glory and eternal bliss in the presence of God and his Christ. It is your entrance into the eternity of happiness. Death may frighten, it may terrify, it may hurt. That is bodily. But it cannot hurt, as the Puritan said, your better part. Your soul is safe, your eternity is secure. Death will be a friend to those very things. It will send your soul home, and it will bring you safe to your eternal dwelling. Remember Pilgrim's Progress? Hopeful goes forth with great joy, and yet Christian is terrified. Terrified as he crosses the river. Remember what Hopeful says? The bottom is good. It's sure, it's solid. That is the promises of God. There's promises for that, that river that we must cross. There is comfort even here. 
Hopeful is saying to him. God has provided against this fear at death. Lay hold of it. And don't be afraid to be bold with God's promises and take them to your heart and say, God said this to me. But we see a perfect instance in Bunyan's allegory there of the fears and trepidation that may meet a Christian in death. And yet still, death is in some respects our best friend. It brings an end to it all. Go back to Revelation. No more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sin. Home at last. There is no curse in our death. Whatever else may be there, it's going to be okay. Fourth comfort tonight. There is hope and there is help with every cross of suffering we carry. We learned this morning that we can't get out of this world without a cross. We will suffer. We will be persecuted. We will face hardship and trial. This is all by way of the Lord ministering to us in his love and shaping us after Christ. But the point of the gospel is here. Christ alone bore the cross that was born of cursing so that we will never bear anything but crosses born of blessing. Go back to Psalm 89. We spent a good bit of time here some while back. Particularly we looked at this one, did the marrow study. Such a wonderful chapter of the covenant of redemption. That pact between the father and the son. Much could be said here, but as we hear the father's words to the son, who is the David here. What he says concerning David is really concerning Christ, of course. And he speaks of David's offspring. That's the church, the elect, you and me. Speaks here of how he will regard our going away, our backslidings, how he will discipline us, strike us with rods even, but he will never forsake his covenant. That is his covenant with David, Christ. And the promise to Christ is, I will redeem the bride for whom you die. Christ will pay the price and the father promises Christ. I will apply that to them so that they enjoy the full benefit of your accomplishments. All that we're studying in the catechism. Listen with that, with that eye to these verses, beginning in verse 28. The Father is saying, My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. That is Christ. I will establish his offspring forever, and his throne is the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my law... And do not walk according to my rules. If they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all have I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me, like the moon it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. To establish Christ is to establish the church, for he is her head and she is his body. We are inseparably united to Christ. The way by which he will be eternally treated By the Father, in such things as we read here, being established and secure and settled, that is the way by which we will be treated because we bear his righteousness and we are treated as if we obeyed the law of God ourselves and secured that. So all our crosses will be laid down at death No cross can last longer than this momentary brief life. No crosses in heaven, beloved. Only crowns. Christ bears the heavier end of all our crosses. He carries alone the curse and the judgment of it so that we can enjoy the blessing and the help of it. And truth to tell, Christ carries more than the heavier end because he carries us who carry the other end. I love where God says to Jacob, During the famine, he sends him into Egypt, and he says in Genesis 46, don't be afraid to go down into Egypt, because I will go with you. 
That's all the encouragement we need. Whatever cross is laid upon us, whatever suffering God calls us to bear, Christ carries the heavier end because he carries the cursed end. You're left with the blessed end. And yet Christ carries you who carry that end. Christ carries it all. We are upheld by the everlasting arms. We need not be afraid. Embrace your suffering. Give thanks to God for his wisdom in providing it. And pray that it may be sanctified unto you. That's how to carry a cross profitably. And of course, therefore, all our crosses are washed in his blood. All our crosses are sanctified to us. That's how everything works together for good. All our crosses are sanctified. He took the sting from them. He bore the curse of them. They come to us as blessings. That's why Hebrews 12 says God disciplines every son he receives. That discipline is a blessing. Finally tonight, we have this comfort. What do we see in all of this? And bring this together with this morning's lesson as well. But what do we see in all of this as we look at Christ's death for us? We see endless cause to give praise to God for his son Jesus Christ, whom he sent into the world to save us. Christ's sufferings bought all our mercies. He purchased all our blessings. He secures our final victory and glory. John Flavel puts it this way. Prime favors, that means the best favors, right? Prime favors come to us swimming in his blood. All our choicest blessings come by the cross. The worst part of his suffering was the best part of our comfort. Right? This is the chief pillar of our consolation. Let this endear our Savior to us and make us in a deep sense of his love to say in response, thanks be to God for Christ Jesus our Lord. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. As Paul puts it here, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That brings together Sunday school and tonight's lesson. And then we have the sermon to follow it as well in verse 58. It all comes together right here. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What a blessing. What an encouragement. What good news is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. How foolish to look anywhere else for consolation. How foolish to look to any other means of salvation and to seek any other manner of reconciliation. There is none. God put forth his Son to be received by faith as a propitiation for our sins because in him, He dealt with our sins. He dealt with our condemnation. He dealt with our curse in order that through all of his suffering we might be brought the blessing that was in his heart to give to us. Amen.